Well, good morning, everyone, and happy Friday morning to you. Welcome back to Morning Musings, excuse me, here on Now TV. Appreciate so much you being with me. Uh, please spread the word. Tell, tell everybody about this program. This program, I, for the last two years plus, I've been sharing with you and discussing with you the challenge of Christ. In John chapter 10, verse 37, Jesus said, Do not believe me for my word's sake. Believe me for my works. If I do not do the works which my Father has given me, do not believe me. Listen, folks, the uniqueness of this challenge cannot be overemphasized. No other, no other world religion makes such a challenge. Okay? Some world religions, oh, uh, it's just an inner testimony. Or we don't need to prove it. We just need to assert it. Or if you challenge us to prove it, we'll just kill you. Not allowed to question. So when Jesus said in front of a hostile audience, if I do not do, which I say I'm going to do, do not believe me. And I've got to tell you, ladies and gentlemen, it has been so disturbing to me over the years. I used to have, used to set up a booth at the Abilene Christian University Lectures. And uh, unfortunately, some things happened in my own ministry. I haven't been able to do that. But nonetheless, for 10 or 11 years, I went there. And those who went with me, very often it was William Bell. Uh, one time, I believe it, it was even Larry Siegel. But nonetheless, here we were at this uh, center of learning, and we would ask the students. Now, mind you, these are Bible students. These are MDiv students. And these are ministerial students. They're preachers. They're elders, et cetera, et cetera who would come by, and we would engage them. And we would ask them, should we believe in Jesus if he did, did not fulfill all of the promises that he made? And people would look at us like, what are you talking about? And we would present the challenge of Christ to them. I cannot tell you the number of people that would literally say, wow, I had no idea that was in there. Okay, so we would progress from there and say, well, uh, Paul said, if Christ is not risen, your faith is in vain. We, that is the apostles, are found to be false witnesses. And you're yet in your sin. And we would ask, okay, uh, there's the challenge of Christ. Do you believe that that's valid? That if Jesus did not was not raised from the dead, we're not even supposed to believe in him. Well, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, I see what you're saying now. Okay, then, look at what Jesus said in Matthew 16, 27, and 28. The Son of Man will come in the glory of the Father with his angels and shall reward every man according to his works. And verily I say unto you, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. And we asked him, did Jesus keep his word? And this is where it got really interesting and really sad. One person after another, preachers, elders, had no clue these verses were even there. M many of the times, they would say, well, you know, verse 27, that's the end of the world. Uh, verse 28, that's, uh, that's Pentecost. Well, grammatically, that won't work. I'm not going to go into that. But as I've demonstrated earlier in this series, that simply will not work. Grammatically, in the Greek, verse 27 is tied inseparably, irrefutably, undeniably with verse 28. Verse 28 is explaining, expanding on verse 27. <laughs> Just recently on Facebook, I was in a discussion with a dispensationalist. And they were naturally calling me a heretic, you know, false teacher, et cetera, et cetera. 
And I asked them if they believed there were any 2,000-year-old people walking the earth today. And they said, that's ridiculous. What are you talking about? So I copied and pasted Matthew 16, 27, 28 in my response. And I said, do you believe this? And they said, that's just your private interpretation. Now, mind you, all I did was copy and paste. <laughs> they said, no scripture is of any private interpretation. And I pointed out, I didn't interpret anything. Here are the words of Jesus. Did he keep his word, or did he lie, or did he fail? Well, you're just perverting the scriptures. You're relying on church history. <laughs> no, I'm not. This individual realized, and by the way, uh, that was like three days ago. They've since disappeared, abandoned the discussion, and little wonder. They have no answer. So the point of all of this, ladies and gentlemen, is to drive home the absolute necessity for believers to be able to defend Jesus Christ to be able to defend the Bible as his word, trustworthy, inerrant, inspired. And if you're not prepared, sooner or later you're going to come up and you're going to meet a, a Muslim, and he's going to bring up Matthew 16, 27, and 28, and he's going to say, did Jesus keep his word? And you're going to be standing there flat-footed. If you discuss these things with a Jew, same thing. There used to be a, a website entitled Jews for Judaism. And they had a page, a special dedicated page on why Jesus cannot be the Messiah. One of the reasons listed was he was a false prophet. He said he was going to come back in the first century, in the lifetime of the first century, to destroy heaven and earth. Obviously, he didn't do it. He cannot be the son of God. Well, I actually posted a challenge on that website to debate someone on that issue, and they absolutely refused. Total silence. But the question, ladies and gentlemen, is can you answer the challenge of Christ if you are confronted by an atheist who, you know, like I recently debated in April of 2023, Mark Smith, former Christian, who now believes Jesus lied, he failed. He just didn't keep his word. He has the same materialistic concept of the coming of the Lord, judgment, resurrection, that the Muslim, the Jew. And as a result of the failure of his literalistic interpretation to be fulfilled, he and they called Jesus a liar and a false prophet. Listen, we've been trying to get other atheists to debate us on this very issue. They will not do it. So again, the point of all this, the point of all this entire series is to examine the challenge of Christ and to show Jesus kept his word. He never promised to come back as a five foot five Jewish man in a physical body. Never. I know that's the way the church has historically interpreted his pro prophecies and promises, but that's the wrong interpretation. Now, we just finished a lengthy study, and what I've been trying to do in this study is to show you that Jesus and the New Testament writers were absolutely correct when they said that the appointed time of the end had arrived. They used a very distinctive Greek word, kairos, which means appointed, designated, and very often divinely appointed, designated time. Well, why did they do that? Well, because they could go back into the book of Daniel, and they knew that Daniel had foretold that in the days of the fourth kingdom, which was the Roman Empire, the God of heaven shall set up a kingdom. Now, my dispensational friends say, Oh, well, yeah, well, that was the appointed time, uh, but because of the Jewish unbelief, uh, God couldn't establish the kingdom. No, that doesn't work. Not at all. 
God said he wasn't going to alter the word that had gone out of his mouth in regard to setting the Christ on the throne. I will not alter the word that has gone out of my mouth. Psalms 89, 34 to 37. Jesus would not fail. Isaiah 42, 1 to 4. And on and on it goes. So Daniel chapter 2 foretold the time for the establishment of the kingdom. The Jews living in the first century in the days of the Roman Empire knew, they understood, they had a tremendous expectation of the coming of Messiah and the kingdom. Now, their understanding of the nature of the kingdom was wrong, but they got the time right. You know, it's interesting. When I debated noted Christian apologist, Dr. Michael Brown, I debated him twice. Those debates can be found on YouTube. Just look up Michael Sullivan, debates Don Preston or vice versa. And as I begin to pre present the evidence, Dr. Brown actually said the apostles got the timing wrong, but they understood the nature. Do you understand what this man, good man, but do you understand what he's saying? The apostles got the timing wrong. Wait a minute. Yet over and over and over again, Jesus and the New Testament writers said the appointed time had arrived. Dr. Brown, again, a good man, is accusing the apostles of being wrong. Is that really a road that we want to go down? Secondly, Daniel chapter 7. Once again, the days of the Roman Empire. The little horn would arise, persecute the saints, and wear them out. The Son of Man would come as the Ancient of Days and destroy the little horn. Look, folks, any time and every time you hear someone talking about, oh, the man of sin is alive somewhere in Europe today, as Hal Lindsey said all the way back in the 1980s. Anytime you hear people say, well, you know, uh, the millennium is just around the corner. Rapture is just around the corner. The man of sin has got to be alive. They're wrong. Period. The man of sin, the little horn, was to rise in the days of the Roman Empire, the fourth kingdom of Daniel chapter 7, and was to be destroyed at the coming of the Son of Man. Who's the Son of Man? That's Jesus. Jesus came during the days of the Roman Empire, Luke chapter 3. The time was right. The appointed time had come. So I'm reiterating an awful lot of this to drive home what we've been studying for the last little bit, and that's Daniel chapter 9, 24 and following. Daniel was told, Daniel, 70 weeks are determined on your people and on your holy city to put away sin, to make the atonement, to finish the transgression. We've spent a good deal of time talking about fi finishing the transgression, which means to fill up the measure of sin. I was reading a work, actually it's a quotation of a work, most of that work has been lost, but it was quoted by Eusebius in the 4th century. The writer's name was Aquila. And Aquila, this ancient writer, along with, by the way, Chrysostom and Tertullian uh, and Eusebius, pardon me, said that to finish the transgression meant fill up the measure of sin. That's what Aquila said it meant as well. So it's interesting to me for those who like to appeal to the patristic writers, and the patristic writers so very, very often said to, uh, to finish the transgression meant to fill up the measure of Israel's sin. Why won't they accept that? Well, one of the reasons that they will not accept that patristic testimony is because they know that if Israel finished the transgression, filled up the measure of sin in the first century, that means the 70 weeks were filled up in the first century. And that destroys their future as paradigm. Here's the kicker to this, ladies and gentlemen. 
Daniel 9 said 70 weeks are determined to finish the transgression, to fill up the measure of Israel's sin. Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John all spoke of Israel filling up the measure of her sin in the first century. Now, wait a minute. Since Daniel chapter 9 said the 70 weeks were determined to fill up the measure of Israel's sin, and Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John all said Israel's sin was being filled up in the first century, that means the end of the 70 weeks belonged to the first century, ladies and gentlemen. You can't get it beyond that unless you're willing to take the position, oh, well, Israel hasn't yet filled up the measure of her sin. You see the problem? The 70 weeks were determined to fill up the transgression, finish the, to finish transgression to fill up the measure of sin. Having covered that, and let me reemphasize this, Daniel set the time for the fulfilling or the filling up of the measure of sin. Jesus, Paul, Peter, John, all said that measure of sin was being filled up and was filled up, Revelation chapter 17, verse 6, in the first century. That means that the appointed time of the end, because that's what Daniel 9 is all about, the appointed time of the end had arrived in the first century. So one more time, for repetition, I hope this is not redundant. When you read and when you hear dispensational writers say, we are waiting on the fulfillment of Daniel 9 and the, and the 70th week. And they say, we're waiting for the full restoration of Israel and the fulfillment of God's promises to Israel. What they're doing is one of two things. They're denying that Israel filled up the measure of her sin in the first century, or they're saying, well, yeah, okay, maybe Israel filled up the measure of her sin in the first century, but we're still waiting for the end of the 70th week. No, the end of the 70th week was going to be judgment on Israel. Daniel 9, 26 and 27, the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the full end thereof shall be with an overwhelming flood. The end thereof of what? The 70th week. The destruction of Jerusalem. You see how powerful this is? So, having discussed, having demonstrated that Israel filled up the measure of her sin in the first century, having demonstrated that Jesus, Paul, Peter, and John all said that and placed that filling up of the measure of the sin in the first century, ladies and gentlemen. It cannot be overemphasized that this proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that the appointed time of the end had arrived. Again, I'm sorry if that seems redundant. I'm sorry if that seems repetitious, but it's critical to get this point. So having established that point, let's move on to our very next subject in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. Daniel 9, 70 weeks are determined to put away sin, to make the atonement. Finish transgression, to seal vision and prophecy. Now listen, folks, this is, this is extremely, extremely important. Now, before I go on, let me let you know, and not much time left, okay? <coughs> Pardon me, but... For the rest of September 2023, <laughs> boy, it's difficult to get a hold of that. Okay, uh, very, very special, two book special. And again, this is for the month of September 2023, U.S. orders only. I can't make the offer for out of U.S. orders, okay? My book, Seal Up Vision and Prophecy, and yes, I know it doesn't say seal up, okay, but that's what I put. That's what I put in the title anyway. This book is an in-depth examination of the, of the meaning 
of the phrase seal, vision, and prophecy. And as a direct corollary to that, my brand new book, These Are the Days When All Things Must Be Fulfilled. Both of these books, ladies and gentlemen. Now, if you bought these books separately, okay, and paid postage on each one, then you would spend 37, 38 bucks. But for the rest of this month, September 23, U.S. orders only, <laughs> total delivered price $31.50. But that's not all. In addition to these two books, at the one price to save yourself about seven bucks, seven fifty, I'm going to include an absolutely free copy of my book, Can God Tell Time? Okay, that would cost you an additional two ninety five plus an additional four ninety five. So, in addition to the seven dollars and fifty cents you're saving on the purchase of the new books, you're getting an extra book, absolutely free, and free postage on all three books. Uh, you know that's going to save you eleven, twelve bucks. My math's not good, but figure it out. All right, go to my website, donkpreston.com, BibleProphecy.com. There's a wonderful tab right up at the very top. You need to go there and order these two books, and you will, when the offer is submitted or the order is submitted, I will automatically include free of charge. Can God tell time? Now then, Daniel was told, don't have much time left. But I want to get this in. Daniel was told 70 weeks are determined to seal vision and prophecy. What in the world does that mean? This is amazing, ladies and gentlemen. Did you realize that across the entire spectrum of eschatological thought, there is virtually, among conservatives, I should point out, among conservatives, there is a broad consensus. Maybe it's not unanimous, but boy, there's a widespread agreement that seal of vision and prophecy or seal of vision and prophecy means to close the prophetic office, to bring the prophetic office to its close through and by means of the fulfillment of all prophecy. You catch the power of that? Seal of vision and prophecy means to bring the prophetic office to a close through the Fulfillment of all prophecy. Now, let me give you an example. Reading from page four of my book, Seal of Vision and Prophecy, okay? Let me read to you some quotes from some of the most highly respected scholars, Hebrew scholars, by the way, in the history of the Christian church. Quote, many commentators believe that Daniel was foreseeing the fulfillment of one prophecy, i.e., that of Jeremiah, that it was fulfilled in the period of Antiochus Epiphanes during this period. Well, that's not the quotes I wanted to get to. You'll have to excuse me. Uh, okay, here we are. Huh, excuse me. Okay. Uh, prophecies and prophets are sealed when by the full realization, full realization, of all prophecies, prophecy ceases. No more prophets anymore appear. The impression of translators, number two, being that all vision and all prophecy were to receive completed fulfillment in the course of the 70 weeks. It appears to be more agreeable to the context to suppose that the prophet is speaking of the absolute cessation of all prophecy. Well, when would all prophecy uh, cease? Uh, when it was fulfilled. Number three, the vision and prophet will be sealed, that is, accredited, because their final accomplishment has been reached in those events of blessings for God's earthly people. Number four, the reference is not to the accrediting of the prophecy, but to the sealing it up so that it no longer appears. Its functions are finished. It is not henceforth needed. No more prophecy. The words taken together refer to the final fulfillment of revelation and prophecy when their functions are shown to be finished. The words taken together, I'm sorry, verse number six, to set seal to them, to ratify and confirm the prophet's prediction. The close of the 70 weeks will bring with it the confirmation of the prophetic utterances. The American version and the revised version, seal up, means to close up, preclude from activity. The sense of the expression upon this view being supposed to be that prophecies being fulfilled, prophet and vision will be needed no more. The idea is, number seven, that everything in the form of prophetic visions and predictions that had been produced in the course of theocratic development from the time of Moses should receive sealing, i.e. the divine confirmation and recognition in the form of fulfillment. 
Number eight, to fulfill the anticipation of all prophetic books. Number nine, the idea seems to be that they would at that time be all sealed in the sense that they would be closed or shut up, no longer open matters, but that the fulfillment would, as it were, close them up forever. Barnes also cites Hengstenberg, Gesenius, Gesenius' Hebrew lexicon, and Langerke as concurring with the idea that vision and prophecy are sealed by, full, by fulfillment. Number 10, to put an end to the necessity of any further revelation. By completing the canon of Scripture, fulfilling the prophecies which related to his person, sacrifice, and the glory that should follow. Number 11, the sealing up of vision and prophet impl implies the confirming and fulfilling of all of the sacred oracles that had spoken of the great day of the Lord and the glorious age to follow in which the earth would be full of the knowledge of Yahweh. And then I list, in addition to these 11 quotes, I list an additional 10 to 15 authors who all agree on the same identical definition of seal, vision, and prophecy. Let, let me say this once again. These quotes are from millennialist, dispensationalist, all millennialist, and post-millennial millennialist. In other words, across the entire spectrum of eschatological belief, there is a virtual, not 100%, but you know, <laughs> I'm James widespread, agreement that Daniel was being told 70 weeks are determined to put an end to the prophetic office through and by means of the fulfillment of all prophecy. Folks, you got to catch the, the power of that. If vision and prophecy were sealed by the end of the 70th week, and the end of the 70th week was in AD 70, then all prophecy is fulfilled. We've got a whole lot more, so I'll see you on the flip side.